season two, madly interesting people. The new people get more interesting. Rick and I, we stay just as interesting as we were before. I'm Cami Chaos. And I am Rick Terosi. And as you may have learned, we are mildly interesting people, which somehow puts us in the lives of wildly interesting people on a regular basis. So what we do is we convince those wildly interesting people to come talk to us for your entertainment. I don't know why they do it, but they continue <laughs> to do it. So, Cami, who is our guest for this week? Our guest this week is one of the people when we discussed for an extended period of time whether or not we would ever do this show was on our list as as one of our guests. Like from the very beginning, we've always wanted an excuse. Well, we always want an excuse to talk to this person. <laughs> Uh, he's the world's most intelligent man, the world's smartest, smartest man, the smartest, world's smartest yes. man. He might yeah. be the world's sexiest man as well. We've mm-hmm. seen some some billboard like photos. Uh, he has a special place in my heart. He has a very special place in Rick's heart. Um, mm-hmm. And really, if he doesn't have a special place in your heart by the end of the show, I'm wondering where your heart is located. Yeah, what are you doing, even? <laughs> Please welcome to the show the one and only, the absolutely phenomenal Saul Colt. I am so excited to be here. And, and um, <laughs> if you guys need any proof that the two of you have a special place in my heart, I can't tilt my camera, but on my wall, no more than seven <laughs> feet from me is a, a photo canvas of the three of us at the Empire State <laughs> Building um, that I stare at every day. And it's one of my fondest memories. I'm so glad that you <laughs> Yeah, that was um, a very romantic uh, very moment romantic. for the three yes. of us. Yeah, yes. it was. Hmm. It was uh, it was beautiful. Uh, I often refer to these two as my birthday boys uh, because hmm. Rick and Saul share a birthday uh, and a birth year, hmm. and I don't like know what exactly, time. Like exactly, yeah. exactly a birthday. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know what time. I don't know what the time lapse is. I don't think we need to tell everyone when you all were born, but uh, I think that's something we might need to look into in the future. I've asked my my mom before she passed away when I was born, and both my parents, and this may um, say something about my parents, neither of them remember at the time I was born. <laughs> and if you want any indication, I love my parents to death. They were wonderful parents. But any indication of what my childhood was like, I have a glass, and I still have to this day, that has my name and my birthday like engraved, like etched out in the thing. And it's off by two years. So I'm not even sure <laughs> if my parents knew what uh, year I was born. Um, so I think the glass is actually the date that they got the glass and not the date I was born. I'm not sure. But it is the same day, just the wrong year. <laughs> you know, parents, mm. we do our best. Yes. That sounds like, yeah. <laughs> to be mm. fair, sometimes I don't remember what year I was born. So mm. Mm. I don't know. Uh, there, as with many of our guests, there are so many directions that we could go. And I've got like three things off the top of my head, but Rick, I'd like to offer you the first question, the first prompt, the first. (laughs) This is the thing she does where she's like, I don't know where I'm going with this. No, I know. You want me to go I'm just going to kick it to you. I don't know. You can. I want you to go somewhere, but I have things to go with. Well, go ahead. I no. Why don't you go ahead? I'm curious to see where you're going to go and I will follow your lead because you're the, you're the talent. I'm just the producer here. Yeah, that's right. So before we started recording, we were having a little chat with Saul. He's trying some positivity bullshit. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, And as a person who I'm a bright sider, I don't know if that's an actual term or if that's a term that I made up, but I always try to find the bright side of something. And I think part of it is just due to like a, a lifetime of overwhelming anxiety. I always look for something positive out of something negative. So mm-hmm. I'm no stranger to positivity. Um, I'm just bad at it. I want to know how it's working for you, what you're doing. Like, I want to talk about positivity. stuff. Hi, so positivity is not my default uh, mindset. Um, I, 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 I had a conversation with a, a client the other day, and uh, and they 
they basically said that I worry too much. And I Hmm. told them that that's what you're paying me to do. I worry about everything. My mind never takes a rest or a break because I'm trying to see everything that could go right and everything that could go wrong. And for the majority of my life, I've always been consumed with the what could go wrong. And, um, and, you know, and I, and I, I, and I didn't have an epiphany or I didn't have a moment or anything. I just like, I don't know, maybe it was, I was lost in a bunch of stupid Instagram reels or something where it's just, you know, positivity bullshit after (laughs) positivity. And, you know, like it's, you know, and, and and I got all these, uh, it's so funny. Like I, I, at night before I go to sleep, I like to kind of scroll through Instagram as like my last thing is I, I, I enjoy Instagram the most out of all the, the social mm-hmm. media platforms. And, and if you just click like the reels and you don't sort of prompt it by like going through anything, I find like my algorithm, which might be different <laughs> than you guys, I get one topic every night and it goes really deep, but they're all mm-hmm. random. So there'll be Mm -hmm. nights where I'm only getting like, like male, like, like man on man love stuff, guys coming out of like the pool with like bikinis, like, you know, speedos and other nights. I think so I had this one night where all I got was manifestation and affirmations and, Ah. and, and, and like, I don't know, like I'm, I'm like a bit of a jaded person. Like when you see these, these videos and they say, oh, you'll get $10 million if you just share and like, and, you know, send this three people and, and all this stuff. And, and in my head, I know it's nonsense, but there's, um, there's this thing in Judaism. Um, uh, I can't think of what it's actually called, but it's basically, um, there, there's this belief in Judaism that, you know, there's a lot of people who don't believe in God, but you're sort of hedging bets just in case there really is a God. <laughs> you, you sort of do like just enough to make mm-hmm. sure that like if there is a heaven, you're going to go to it. Even if you like, you know, like like common sense tells you that all these stories make no sense because people don't live to 120 and they're not having babies at 90 years old and all these things. <laughs> but just in case, you know, maybe you're going to do just enough. So, uh, so I'm watching all this stuff and then, and I, I didn't fall for like, I'm not saving them and I'm not sharing them, but I'm just like, man, what if I actually did just like mm-hmm. try to be a little bit more positive and it's worked for me because like, I'm not like a doom and gloom person. I think I'm more of a pragmatist. I see the reality in the world and I know the world isn't like, like filled with like sunshine and, and lollipops. There's a lot of hatred and bad people. And, and, and really like it's, it's soul crushing sometimes how, like how heavy things are right now. Um, but I'm just like, I'm really trying. So like a perfect example is like, um, you know, and, and, and I know we're, I'm not here to talk about too much work, but I'll speak in generalities. We were Mm -hmm. pitching a project for work that would have been the biggest project we ever worked on, biggest Mm -hmm. revenue, biggest, like, you know, scope, biggest everything. And uh, it came down to final two people and they went with the other person. And like, for some reason, I wasn't even weirdly upset because like, I I think I had already talked myself into, if we get it, that would be so amazing instead of if we don't get it, like we're all going to die kind of thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, um, and, um, and it was so weird because, and and even in my response, normally my response would be, um, you guys are stupid. You know, you're (laughs) nothing's going to work without us. I'm, I'm no one loves you as much as I love you. That's my favorite, like (laughs) nineties, like high school TV trope. Um, but, um, but I actually responded and I was just like, you know, I, I wish, you know, the, the news of this email was different, but if anything happens, you have a problem, we're still here to help in any way. And mm-hmm. I don't know if it's, it's changed me in any way. It's caused me a little less stress, but like, man, like the, the doom and gloom still creeps up and still thing like, um, you know, like I, I was, I was saying to you guys before we, uh, before we hit record, um, I've been in business 
coming up to 15 years with my little agency. And it's always been like just kind of me for 10 years. And mm -hmm. the last like five years, we have like a lot of people. It's like a 29 person agency. And like, I almost feel like I have to be positive because it like, there's nothing scarier in the world to me than having people rely on me to yeah. like, like feed them and clothe them and all that stuff. And I take that stuff so, so seriously. Um, but man, like that is like, you know, like people say that starting your own business is like the scariest thing you'll ever do. I think hiring employees is the scariest thing you'll ever do. Cause like yep. I can eat ramen. I can, you know, I can, I can rough it for a little while, but, um, you know, it's like, uh, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm like Martin Kelly, the, the guy you had in your last <laughs> episode. I, I'm just going to go for 25 minutes, but, um, <laughs> so, if it makes you feel any better, you've answered three questions that I would have asked as a follow on. You just kept answering questions I, that I yeah. haven't asked yet. So oh, well, good go. night, everybody. Um, <laughs> but, um, need it here. Yeah. But um, I uh, I grew up in a family business and, and you know, I, I always tell people like I went to the best business school ever because I learned everything from being beside my dad and uh, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And like one, you know, my dad would impart these little nuggets of witticism, if that's the wisdom, not witticism. And uh, he would always say, like, you could treat your employees bad as long as you don't like fuck around with their paycheck and like i try not to treat anybody bad but um but man like you you just you can't not you know you, you just whatever it's like if you're the boss you gotta make sure people are are not getting screwed around and that's something that has sort of tried to i i've used that as motivation to force me to try to be more positive because like i would I don't, you know, I used to have this like internal rule where like I would never, I'd give myself 24 hours to feel like shit or to wallow whenever I got mm -hmm. bad news. Mm -hmm. And then I just yep. realized like I just fucking gave up a day. Like, and, and a I'm not going to get all Gary V on you because I, I think Gary V is wrong <laughs> on almost everything he says. But, but, um, but yeah, like just sort of one day I realized, well, like that was a waste of time. Might as well mm -hmm. just shake it off as fast as you can and go back to whatever, like, you know, whatever is in front of you and whatever you need to do. Cause, um, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I, I, I haven't cracked the code. I still feel miserable, you know, at certain times and I'm not one of these people that smiles all day. And, and, yeah. you know, to a certain extent, I think happiness is kind of like, like a mental illness. Like it's weird if you're always happy and nothing breaks through the armor. Um, like those people scare me. Um, but, um, <laughs> but there's but, no um, danger from them in this room. We're all yeah, good here. Yeah. But I'm I'm making a real effort. I haven't gone all in. I'm not meditating. I'm not doing that mm -hmm. stuff. But I'm just trying to force myself to, you know, maybe be a bright side or like you or just, you know, or just like not let stuff bother me. Like it's more of a look forward and not behind kind of thing um, yes. because there's nothing you can really do but what's behind you and 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 stuff like that. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying. I have, one, while we're on this path, yeah, I have one other thing that I want to talk about. It's about positivity and how it's about work. Mm -hmm. And it's about a childhood dream. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about Mad Magazine. So Mad oh, Mag you just stomped on my question. <laughs> um, Mad Mag so if I were to say to you, if someone were to ask me, what are the three things that formed my sense of humor more than anything? I would say it's Mad Magazine, early David Letterman, and oh, wow. um, and probably Howard Stern. Although I don't, hmm. I don't really identify as a Stern fan anymore. It's like I, um, I look at Stern kind of as Mad Magazine, and I wish I had thought of this. But um, a good friend of mine wrote kind of a a. Um, an obituary for Mad Magazine when they they you know folded three years ago, and he said that um, Mad Magazine was the most important thing to every male boy when they were fourteen years old because mm -hmm. it taught us uh, it taught us about holding a mirror up to society. It taught us what satire and parody was, and it taught us to think and not just believe. Uh, which is also a Ralph Nader quote. So you've got like the whole uh, thing there. Um, 
And, and, you know, like I, I, that really kind of like hit me in the stomach because mad was so important to me as a kid and like, and, and, and William Gaines, who is the founder of mad is literally one of my heroes. Like he's the guy, you know, and people always say, who would you invite to dinner living or dead? It's, it's William Gaines. He was the strangest, most eccentric, like guy, but like, I, I have a book here in my bookcase. I have like 20 copies. I'll mail you guys one. Um, They're like 99 cents on on Amazon, and I buy them (laughs) whenever I can. But it's called Days Gone Mad. And it's it's a book about what it was like to work at Mad Magazine. And I always give it to people and say, this is the most accidental work culture book, like the best most accidental work culture book I've ever read. Because Bill Gaines did so many ridiculous things to create a really nurturing, weird environment for people to do their best work. Mm -hmm. In 1990, or no, in 2000, they were still typing on typewriters as opposed to computers because he thought typewriters were funnier. Like they that, are, and they make and, clickety clack, clickety clack yes. noises. They're so soothing. He, um, William Gaines was the, the he, he was very wealthy. He sold Mad to Warner Brothers, um, but he, but part of the deal was he got to keep Mad and run it autonomously. He did this thing called Mad Trips, which, like, if I was ever in the position financially to do, I would love to do this. But instead of giving Christmas bonuses to his employees, they started this thing called Mad Trips, where all he would tell you was hot or cold. And he would take his entire staff, including their spouses and kids, and he would, like, charter a plane. And, like, so the whole story was he became a foodie late in life, and he would read about some restaurant in Italy and he, in the only way he could write it off as a business expense was he <laughs> took everybody in the company and their kids and their spouse. Mm-hmm. And if you worked at MAD, he did these for 20, like 25 straight years. Wow. So his employees went to China, to Africa, Japan, Italy, Morocco, all these exotic places, just because he read like about a dish in a restaurant that he wanted to try and he would never eat alone. And, and, you know, the, like William Gaines invented the tuxedo t-shirt because he would go to fancy restaurants and he refused to wear a tie. So he would wear a jacket and he had one of the <laughs> mad guys draw a tie on a t-shirt so he could go to these restaurants. Like just every story about mad is so wonderful. And mm-hmm. if there was anyone to emulate, like he's the guy I'd much rather be you know i'd much rather be more like william gaines and be you know like like you know elon musk or steve jobs or any of these people that it's all about getting the best work out of people by holding a sword over their head and and stuff like that it was just he created such a weird and fun environment that you know that was their culture and 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 they created amazing work so um i think what you guys are trying to get to is you know three three years ago, um, I had the honor, and and still do to this day. It's an absolute honor. But I I was able to reunite the the creative team from Mad Magazine if they were all sort of uh, you know let go from from the publication and bring them in as our in house creative team. And it's been such an amazing experience to to get to work with these people it's been a learning curve um and i I think it took me probably a year to figure out how to get the best work out of these people um Mm -hmm. they're so talented and so creative but there was just a bit of a gap between like figuring out what's the funniest thing in the world that we could do right now as opposed to what's the funniest thing in the world that actually is good for the client and actually wow. good to like you know the target market and stuff like that but i think we've nailed it now and um you know and it's like i don't think there's there's not one thing that we delivered i'm not proud of i think the learning curve was that it took us a little longer you know like the the delivery of the goods were a little longer than we thought it would take because it just took a little longer to sort of nail that 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 nugget or or of truth or or whatever but but man like you know it's just uh 
the stories, the the experiences, the actual work they're doing. Like these people are so gifted and so creative. And you know, you, you know, like my, my other comment, talk about holding up a mirror to society. It, yeah. it doesn't always translate well to client work, but man, these guys just look at the world so differently. And it's such a delight to um, have different perspectives and have like meaningful conversations with people that just sort of have just such vast different experiences. Because I, I feel like, you know, there was a time in my life when I was only talking to like people who worked in the tech industry and I love right. the tech industry and, and, and all that stuff. But, you know, like, um, you know, and, and it's awful to see what's happening to San Francisco right now. I don't know if guys have read about like Union Square is basically imploding and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I worked a year in San Francisco and I really didn't like the city because like it was just bizarre to me to go to networking events and people were getting two million dollars just because they bought a really clever URL and they hadn't yeah. built anything yet. And like, this is, you know, a decade ago or whatever, but it just sort of like wore me down. Like it wasn't, these weren't my people. And uh, so it, it's, it's nice to, you know, sort of find your people. Like you guys are very much my people. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it's, 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 I, I used to love reading Esquire magazine and, uh, and I was really kind of upset. They dropped this feature, but they used to have this thing called things I learned. And they would interview like a famous person and they would probably have like an hour long conversation and they would just pull out like 25 bullet points, kind of like throwaway kind of lines. And, um, and I always remember, um, uh, uh, Jeffrey Tambor who, you know, from, from Larry <laughs> Sanders show and, yeah. and stuff like that, of course. He's had his problems, you know, most recently got in trouble by making some, some trans related comments and stuff like Jeffrey. that. But, um, but this came out before that, so we can still love him, um, you know, at the time of this interview. Um, but he basically said the secret to life is finding the people who get you. And like, that's literally it. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just find the people who get you. And that always stuck with me. And, and um, I think it, I wish I had learned that earlier in life because i feel like you know it's really only been in the last decade that i feel like i found the people who get me as opposed yeah. to trying to be you know whatever commercially viable or you know however you want to describe them yeah. yeah. um have i answered any of your questions i yes. feel like you're yes. just winding me up and Absolutely. and i'm just i'm just i'm like one of those little Japanese <laughs> robot toys that just click, yeah. click, 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 click. No, this yeah. is great. Uh, you have answered my questions. And also, apparently, <laughs> I stole Rick's question. But how could I not ask about Mad? I mean, seriously. Mm -hmm. Rick. Yeah. Well, I thought we'd wait till, I thought we were going to tease it a little longer. No. I was waiting, <laughs> but, but we got no. right into it. So <clears throat> something I learned during the first season is that I ask these really long, rambling questions and then hit the people with the stinger at the very end. And then they sit there blank face trying to figure out how to respond to my question. So I'm going to try a different technique this season. So I'm going to start with the stinger. And then while you're thinking of it, I will ramble on about things that might spark some ideas for you. So I'm, I'm, I, I hope you're okay engaging in this experiment with us, but I trust that you are. I'm up for anything. Okay. So the, the hard hitting question is Saul, where do you find the courage? As long as I've known you, you've put yourself out there in uncomfortable ways. You've tried things that have the potential of failing. You, you acquire talent from someone who is you know, an, an organization that was run by someone who is very much your idol and were very big shoes to step into. Was there a point in your life as young Saul, as early professional Saul, like, was there a moment that taught you to embrace that courage and take that risk? Or is that just something that comes naturally to you? Um, I, I think it comes naturally, but I think it's, it, boils down to like, you know, a little bit of like blissful ignorance, 
you know, like I, I, I don't think I'm, you know, like I, I don't think I'm so courageous that, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I kind of feel like I can figure anything out. Um, you know, like in, and like, like I said, it took me a year to figure out how to get this team to really work, you know, at, at maximum, you know, potential, we'll call it. I don't want to say efficiency. Efficiency sounds more like, you know, twisting arms. Um, but, you know, so it's like, I feel I can figure out anything, but it doesn't mean I could figure it out overnight. And it doesn't mean I'm going to figure it out. And, you know, like I, I, you know, like I, I, I've been around risk takers my whole life. Um, not maybe not big, big risk takers, but just like people who take risks. And, and like, I kind of realized that, you know, I don't know. I, I probably realized about 10 years ago that I'm, I'm largely unemployable. Um, and, <laughs> and I, and I, I, what I mean is like, like, you put me in a, a position. So one of the best things that ever happened to me was growing up in a family business. One of the worst things that ever happened to me was growing up in a family business. Um, you know, like I, I did not have that idyllic childhood of privilege and, and stuff like that. I, 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 I used to joke with my parents that I think I was only born like, as like labor or free labor. Like, um, you know, I was the only 13 year old that had a credit card and the credit card was used to take the, a taxi at the end of school to get to the office. And, you know, like I would be sweeping floors. Like I literally did every role in that company from, from sweeping floors. When I was 16, I got my truck driver's license. And while some people worked at summer camps, I was driving an 18 foot straight truck doing deliveries, um, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. It was very different. Now they've got like graduated licenses and you can't, you know, all that stuff. I like, I got my, my, my general license and my truck driver's license on the same day. Wow. It was just like, <laughs> just like, yeah, no, cool. It's like, can we get you a pack of smokes at the same time? I'm like, no, I'm good. <laughs> um, I worked so hard and I didn't really have like a college experience because I chose where I went to school based on what was closest to our office. So if I had a three hour break, I could come back and work and stuff like that. So by no means was it, you know, fun and playful and, and all that stuff. And, uh, but, you know, like it sort of set me on a path, whereas like I was always the boss or one step removed from the boss. So, um, one, it made me have to think and strategize and understand the whole picture, but it also made me really hard to respect authority from other people because like I kind of do think I'm smarter than a lot of people that I've worked for. And, and, and I think I, I've shown it and it's gotten me in trouble and my mouth has gotten me in trouble. I've mellowed a great deal as, as I've gotten older, but you know, like if, if, you know, one of my famous youthful rebellion work stories was a very early time in my professional career working for someone other than my my family um i stood up at a meeting and i called everybody in the room abortionists because they were killing my babies and and wow. stuff like that yeah well, listen it was a different yeah. time can yeah. yeah. you know it's <laughs> like it's like my dad uh, I, I love my dad he's 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 one of these people that are accidentally funny sometimes um I don't know if you guys have seen the absolutely brilliant Gilbert Godfrey documentary, just called Gilbert. Um, such a beautiful, so. wonderful documentary. And he tells the story in, in the documentary. He's doing stand, like they would cut away to, to stand up. And he, he, he's got this routine where um, he's talking about um, uh, Phillips from the mom and the papas and how the, 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 the daughter, the, the father basically had sex with her for a year. Like it's really gross. Uh, but the joke is that he said, he goes, listen, I don't want to have sex with my daughter. I just wanted to know that that Barbie dream house didn't come uh, for free. And like, it's just like a really like awful kind of joke. And I, I turned to my dad and he literally looked at me straight face. He goes, it was a different time. 
And I'm just like, whoa, I don't even want to like change the, the topic. I don't know the way this is going. Um, but uh, yes, it was a different time and I'm a different person now. I'm, I'm Mr. Positivity. But, um, Mr. Positivity. Yeah. But I, um, I, I've, I've sort of had trouble, you know, recognizing authority. So it's just better that I, I work for myself and it gives mm -hmm. me a better opportunity to work on multiple things and be hyper creative and all those things. Although now all I do is BD because I have to make sure people get fed and, and paid. Right. So, uh, stuff like that. But, um, but you know, like I, it, it's so funny. I think that no matter what, we always want what we can't have. So people with curly hair want straight hair. People with straight hair want curly hair. Um, people like, you know, say, oh, it must be so wonderful working for yourself. And there are days where it's the greatest thing in the world. But man, like when I daydream, I daydream of being like vice president of like the Portland Trailblazers. And <laughs> I want one of those jobs where you could just show up, put your jacket on the back of the chair and go have a two martini lunch and stuff like that. So <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, everybody wants the opposite of what they have. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't even remember what the question was. I you hope answered I answered that. that. You, I, did. Yeah. you did. You did. You got oh, so really just early on. Getting, getting back to it, though. Why do yeah. I take risks? Um, yes. Getting up in the morning is a risk. Crossing the street is Fair. a risk. You know, like we are literally all going to die. Like there's mm -hmm. no way the three of us, I hope not together. And I hope not for a long time, <laughs> like not in a car or something. We're all going to die someday. We're all yes. going to yes. die. So it's like, you know, yep. it's the, the idea of like, you know, playing it safe is just like, it's, it's a little, you know, I, I, I look at all these people getting laid off in tech and there was a story yeah. locally about, you know, the, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm in, I'm in Toronto, the, there, there's two giant, uh, like telcos. And one of the telco is basically like gutting their company and laying off kind of like a, a Facebook, like, you know, wave of the hand and 10,000 people are gone. And, and these are all like creative people who are working at their radio stations, their TV stations and stuff. Like that. And I'm like, these jobs will never, ever come back. So it's like, mm -hmm. we're talking like, I don't know, 2% of the population. It, it was, was kind of like waved away because of all these tech layoffs in the last like 90 days. Like, these are people who are either going to have to go into business for themselves and absorb an enormous risk, or they're going to have to change industries. Like yeah. mm -hmm. we live in maybe one of the scariest times ever to be like a worker, you know, it's like, and, you know, like, and, and all this AI stuff, which I think is bullshit. And I don't think it's going to take away jobs because <laughs> like, like, fuck, like I've, I've used chat GBT and yes, I, I saw like in your interview, it's a wonderful kind of like thought starter, but there's people who are leaning on it heavy and it's yeah. all garbage. Like everything yeah. looks like a 1995 Mashable article, top five ways <laughs> to do anything and, uh, and, and stuff like that. So it's like, it, does that mean every piece of content is now going to be listicles again and mm -hmm. stuff like that? And, and it's like, um, I mean, if, listicles are easier to read, but they are. But if anything, <laughs> I embrace our robot overlords because real human writing and real human creative is going to stand out so far and above this stuff. <laughs> but it's just yep. so weird that people are making knee jerk reactions and saying, we don't need copywriters anymore. We don't need this anymore. And it's like, it's scary. Like I'm, I, you know, like I, I hope. In 12 months from now, there's there's a, a course correct and people realize that these things are wonderful. But like almost mm -hmm. anything like art wise or visual that I've seen, like using like mid journey and stuff, it's kind of cool looking, but it's exactly the same. Yep. But yeah. um, so it's like, you know, you know, I don't know. I'm not a fan. It's also pulling yeah. from I mean, yes. Is it creating something? Sure. It's not really creating something, though. It's pulling from everything that humanity has created yeah. and mashing it all together and being like, is this what you meant? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. 
fix the only way I, I'll buy into all this stuff is if the government all gives us like a million dollars a year in subsidized income and we can just all kind of like ease into like Wally, where the chairs <laughs> all move and we can all get disgustingly obese. And mm-hmm. like I would just eat Cinnabons all day long. And that's mm-hmm. like, I don't know, that's maybe the dream right there. <laughs> well, and it, it just dawned on me, and maybe it's because of our history on the interwebs, but like, as you were describing the chat GBT stuff, it just, it, it kind of dawned on me that it strikes me like the late nineties days of SEO Mm -hmm. when everything started to sound the same because we were all writing for the spider to understand what we were writing Mm -hmm. about and not the Mm -hmm. humans to consume. And so there's something very similar to that time period. Um, Speaking of yes, go your ahead. history on the internet, yeah. Rick has put me in this position before. I want to hear about your meet cute. How did you guys get? How did you guys become <laughs> friends? So this is how I remember it. Um, <laughs> I deny I was, everything. That's I was not, in Portland. Um, I, I was working at FreshBooks at the time, and I don't remember if it was like a a beer and so, like it, we were at some outdoor patio beer uh, and mm-hmm. blog beer and mm-hmm. blog okay. and um and you know it's like I, I didn't know rick at all at the time but everybody like you know it's like oh i'm going to portland let's you know uh, I'll, I'll see who are like the key people you're supposed to meet and everyone was like oh you got to meet rick but he's you know he's a little rough around the edges and, and stuff like that <laughs> and uh and i was like really intimidated like and we were at this thing and he was like holding court and everyone was just like there was like people like you know like on those romance novel covers where the woman is on the floor holding like the leg looking up to the the subject that was kind of what it was like people were just like like there was like a a rainbow and the clouds parted wherever Rick, Rick is walked. shaking his head, but this yeah. is accurate. Yeah. This yeah. Is- and, um, and I was really intimidated to, to talk to him. And I'm not sure if we said more than like, hello and whatever, like, uh, and, and here's the thing about me also. Um, I'm like, you know, I'm this risk taker. I'm this, but I'm also like pretty introverted, but I can mm-hmm. turn it on when I need to. But like, like, I think I'd been like, in meetings all day long and my my gas tank was like pretty close to the the bottom and i can only like you know be this gregarious person so much um and i think i like i I don't know i don't remember if we talked that much but just you know like i love portland like i really do i have wonderful friends in portland the two of you reggie um weidman Mm -hmm. i have a friend amy scott like i've got so many wonderful friends there so I was trying to come back more and more and more. And also like Nike's my favorite brand in the world, trying to sneak onto the campus and get invited <laughs> to the, to the employee store and stuff like that. So just, that was our first time. Like we, we said like, mm-hmm. Hey, and I don't know, maybe we like hip bumped or something that, that might not have happened, but um, just over time. And then like, you know, through pie and, and through the things. And it's like, I say this genuinely, like we don't talk as much as I, I wish we would talk and things like that, but you are like truly one of the special people in my life. You've done so many wonderful things for, for me over like a decade. I hope that I've returned the favors, but um, Absolutely. like, you know, like, I, I just like, I, I really feel like if I ever needed something, you would like be a, a supportive ear or something like that. And, and, you know, it's like, I, I just, I, I think the world of both of you, but you know, it's just, um, yeah, it, it, our friendship was one that took a couple, a couple bumpings into each other. It wasn't, uh, uh, like an instant sort of, uh, you know, the lightning striking sort of thing, but, Eyes but um, across well, the room. yeah, but and I'm I, don't, I don't, I don't even, I don't even know if I've ever told <laughs> Saul this, but it even predates that because <laughs> prior to that, speaking of the <laughs> introversion and just feeling weird <laughs> about talking to people, 
I can remember like practically stalking Saul at some South by Southwest where I was just <laughs> like, this guy is so great. I want to go see him speak. And like, what, and like I'd see him at a, like at a gathering or something. I'd be like, Oh, that's Saul Colt. I can't really, hmm. can't really talk to that guy. He's too big. <laughs> a deal. And, and then, and here am I saying there's Rick Tarosi. <laughs> I can't talk to that guy. So, hmm. so maybe, maybe guidance for introverts. <laughs> You may be mm. sizing one another up a little too much and maybe just break mm. the tension and, and talk mm. to one another sooner rather than later so that magic can happen. I agree. <laughs> that was pretty uh, magical. <laughs> uh, one thing I wanted to touch on, because it's something that I don't talk about a, a great deal, but like people who are close to me like know this. like Stand-up comedy... And comedians in general are very near and dear to my heart, not only for their uh, ability to master the language in which they're telling the jokes, but like their timing and their cadence and, and all those kind of things. And you've, you've talked a little bit about Bill Gaines, you know, you've, you've mentioned Gilbert Gottfried. Talk to me about Bobcat Coldthwaite. So I, I love Bobcat and, um, so talk about stalking. I, I pretty much stalked <laughs> Bobcat Goldwaith until um, we became, I, I'd say we're good acquaintances. I don't know if we're friends, friends, but like he, he knows exactly who I am. We talk mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, we, we trade texts and stuff like that. But um, I've always, you know, like when you talk about risk takers, um, I've always been drawn to people like Bobcat who take enormous risks and, you know, and, and, um, you know, it, you know, I take risks. I don't think I take the, at the same level as, you know, some of these, these other people, but, you know, like, um, I, I've always loved his, his comedy, his work. Um, you know, when I talk about, you know, my sense of humor was raised on, on Letterman. Letterman was always my favorite, but I watched all the late night shows and mm -hmm. like, you know, like I love Tom Snyder and, and, and Bob Costas and, you know, later with Costas, like I was a kid who pretty much like, you know, I didn't really care that much for prime time, except if Knight Rider or the A Team was on. But <laughs> but man, like I would I would go strong from eleven thirty to one in the morning watching mm -hmm. whoever the guests were. Never really loved Leno that much, um, but but Letterman and Conan and Tom mm -hmm. Snyder and and you know Jimmy Kimmel and all that stuff and like you know and Bobcat always was one of my favorite. Like Bobcat, Pee Wee Herman. Uh, Gilbert, Norm MacDonald, who might be the greatest talk show guest of all times. Um, but I, I used to love seeing Bobcat. He'd come, like he, he lit, you know, um, Jay Leno's desk on fire. Like that is, that's <laughs> taking a huge risk. Like, and he would come on and they would always do crazy stuff. And, you know, it's just, I love people who push the limits either because they're self-destructive, which I don't wish self-destructiveness on anybody, or because they realize that it's like, as a society, somebody has to. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, Bobcat told me the story. He used to open uh, for Nirvana, which is like such a crazy thought. Like he was doing arenas opening for Nirvana, and people literally hated him. <laughs> um, but wow. Kurt, Kurt thought it was the funniest thing seeing him <laughs> like fight for his life on stage before they came out. And, uh, and they, they were doing a, a show in Chicago and it was pretty recent to after Michael Jordan's father was killed. And he made a joke about Michael Jordan's father dying or something. And the place just, you know, like the, the room turned and this and that. And um, at the end of the show, there's like 75 to a hundred crazy you know people at the back door and and the security says they're not here to get autographs they're here to kill you mm -hmm. and what they basically did was they put him in like a burlap sack and like <laughs> rushed him out to like the tour van and threw him in the back because it was the only way they were getting him out of the building like i love mm -hmm. that stuff i love you know i love people who like are willing to risk it all. I'm willing to risk things like 85, 90%. I don't know if I'm willing to go all in. And as I've gotten older, 
I think about like retirement and I think about like, mm-hmm. I'm like one or two bad podcasts away from never working again. <laughs> so, um, so I, I've, I've started censoring myself a little bit more and man, it hurts my stomach. Like most mm. people, it would hurt their stomach to say what's in my head. It hurts my stomach not to say what's in my head because mm. like, it's kind of what I built my career and my reputation on is always just saying what comes to my, my mind, but it goes back to what keeps me up at night. It's, it's, I've got people who are counting on me, so I yeah. can't be as reckless. Although I'm still, I still say stupid things. And I was on a podcast two weeks ago, an advertising podcast, and I went on a 50 minute ramp on how any advertising agency that, that works on Tesla is ridiculously fucking stupid. Um, <laughs> Cause they'll never get paid and their work will get criticized publicly on Twitter. Um, but um, so I still, you know, I still cut loose if that's the right way of saying it. But, um, but you know, it's like, I, I, um, I feel so strongly about certain things. Like I'm, I'm very, um, pro-choice, some very women's rights, some very, uh, a lot of things. And it's like, you know, I raise money for Planned Parenthood. It's like sort of my, my, my charity of choice. And it's like with all the crazy people in the world now, I like, I've, I still do it, but I, like, I hate the fact that I thought about, is this good to do publicly anymore. And I still went mm-hmm. through with it because I believe in it. And I think people should, you know, stand up for what they believe in. But man, like the world has gotten really messy right now. And like, and like I've seen people get canceled for really stupid reasons. And all this stuff about Target, people like, you know, going crazy at Target because they're selling t-shirts with rainbows on them could you imagine having that much free time that you could even yeah. give a second's thought to this like i don't have free time to worry about t-shirts with rainbows like i want these people's jobs um yeah. it's crazy <laughs> that i want to without going into too many details we uh, a local event that was a fundraiser for an lgbtqia nonprofit. Uh, lost their beer sponsor because every more than one because they were afraid of the backlash for sponsoring an LGBTQIA fundraising event. Uh, and that, how do we live in that world? I mean, how do we? Yeah, the whole Bud Light thing. It was it was like we've lost. Like yeah. as as people, we've given up way too much control to fringe groups like it's uh you know people think the jews have all the power um as a jew i'll tell you we don't we don't control the weather we don't even control hollywood anymore um but it's like these these like it i don't know like it it used to be that the the people that shouted the loudest didn't always win and now it seems like they're winning and it's crazy like um I don't know. Like, I almost feel like we should unplug the internet for 30 days and see what it's like when we come back after this Reset. episode, after yeah. this ah. episode gets shared, let's uh <laughs> thing. But, um, but it's just like, you know, you hear stories how, and without going into it, but like elections are won through, you know, online manipulation and all sorts of things mm-hmm. like, you know, like, you know, and, and, you know, whatever you want to say about Twitter, I don't, I barely go there anymore. It's not the same as it used to be, but, but man, it used to be such a delight in the early, like the first five to seven years I made all the the people I care most about in the world I met, you know, through Twitter and, and Mm -hmm. it used to be so wonderful. And now like, I don't know, it's just, uh, you know, it's just not, not the same. And, you know, we can all speculate why I just, uh, I just think, you know, what, you know, it's almost like every good thing should end after a while. And maybe it's time we reinvent what like, you know, privacy is and stuff like that i saw this crazy thing i know i'm rambling but i saw this crazy news article um a a month ago or two three weeks ago time has means nothing to me anymore (laughs) but um but it was basically some company was going to give people a free like 32 inch television 
Um, mm-hmm. But the TV had an extra panel on the bottom and it was going to push you ads 24 hours a day. And even when you mm-hmm. weren't watching TV, your big screen was going to push you ads. And I'm like thinking you can get a, like maybe not a killer TV, you get a pretty good TV for 200 bucks. You're yeah. going to give up all that privacy for $200. Mm-hmm. Like people need to like, you know, sort of value their worth a little bit more. Remember when we were all about um, body positivity? I don't know what um, the the term would be, but like for just like, you know, <laughs> your worth <laughs> when yeah. it comes to digital, yeah. digital yeah. positivity or something. Digital yep. self-worth. Yes. Uh, I'm going to wrap us towards the end, but I am going to ask, we acknowledged this in the little pre chatter when we weren't recording with all of you. <laughs> Saul's one of those people that we could do a season with, uh, a season <laughs> like all the episodes just being solved. So we're probably going to have to have him back, but. Well, was there... and, and, and not to put you on the spot, Cammy, but <laughs> seems like a senior correspondent opportunity That's oh, i'd love that ask. i haven't even i was i was gonna I haven't even got into okay. any hot takes i haven't we haven't <laughs> talked about the 90s blazers there's so many topics we should be we should be going into if you could be the senior correspondent for anything on mildly interesting people what would it be um, I, I would probably um, some of the things that that bring me the most amount of pride to talk about. I'm I'm really fascinated by pop culture collectibles. I oh. I, I love to. I've got a a bookmark, you know, list of like just crap I would buy if all of a sudden I came into some crazy money, and I found some really like weird stuff i i found a a a vintage or i don't know it's vintage but like probably two or three fonts ago a light up mcdonald's sign that was on the outside of a mcdonald's and i want to buy this so badly and put it in my kitchen um because i think it'd be super (laughs) funny to put it in and it's like it's not the m it's all the letters it's like the m-c-d-o-n-a-l-d-s um Mm -hmm. I, I love searching for weird stuff and, and thing. I'm really into art. I've got another, like, I'm like one that, of these people. That is the topic that I am sad that we didn't get into. But I think if we started oh, we talking can. about art, it would be, yeah. well, I think that's its own episode because there's a piece of art that I <laughs> would become a cat burglar and sneak into your house and steal if I could. Oh, the, the eyes and stuff. Yeah. Or the, the So there's a, there's a piece of art right now. That um, it's really expensive, and if I had the money, I would buy it without hesitation. But I'm not like one of these gross people that doesn't acknowledge that it's really expensive, and I don't have the money to buy it. But it is one of the most um, it it caught. There's only two pieces of art that have ever caused me this visceral reaction. Um, mm-hmm. The first one was Jeff Koons. If you've ever seen Michael Jackson with bubbles, the the statue he made of Michael Jackson and mm. his monkey. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. I saw that for real at the Broad Museum in L.A. And it really like I got a little choked up. It was something like really magical. Um, but there's this piece of art by this woman. And I'll. I'll I'll give her a shout out next time because I'm afraid someone will go <laughs> buy it. Um, but it's um, basically what she does is she, and it, it's, it's, it's really like kind of, yeah, I'll, I'll send you guys the link so you can see this thing, but um, she photographs like women who are like supermodel, beautiful, like classically beautiful women. But it's, um, do you guys know what lenticular is? You know, when you like move to the mm-hmm. side, the image yep. changes. So, the, so these are like, like seven feet by five feet wide. They're just these enormous life size things. And the woman will be in like a burqa. So all you see are the eyes. It's a black and white thing. And then when you move to the side, the burqa vanishes. She's naked and she's, and on her chest in Sharpie or ink or whatever, it says, um, like there's different versions one says like fuck the rules change the world all sorts of crazy Mm -hmm. things and it's just like i saw this thing and it's like you know it's like it really like it's like a bit of a punch in the gut um you know like seeing this work and i i I, like i would really 
and, and there's many different pieces and, and all sorts of things, but it's like a really, really powerful, hmm. crazy piece. That's my dream. If I could either just buy art for other people all day long, or I could win the lottery and just amass like a really fucking awesome um, art collection. That's like probably the thing that would make me most happiest in the world. Nice. Okay, so I think are, are we getting to the questions? Senior art, I think it's we're about time, to. Yeah. I think that you, yeah. you are our senior art correspondent right now. Okay. And now it is time for the mildly interesting question round. And these are all new. Yes. Are, yes. They're new. Yes. And there's all a new one. there's a new twist as well. All right. Yes. So I'm going to ask you four questions, and then at the end of the fourth question, I'm going to roll a die. And whatever number that pops up, I'm going to look at my list, and then I'm going to ask you that question. Okay? Yes. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. All right. Question number one. What's one habit you'd like to pick up over the next year? One habit? Um, probably, like, patience. Ooh. I am, um, I, like, I, I don't really think of myself as a very patient person, Um like I, I'm not like, I don't snap at people or yell or scream, but it's like, if I'm waiting to hear like about, you know, news, whether it's good or bad or something, I tend to like, you know, I, I know I told the story how it was like no big deal that uh, we didn't get this project, but um, while it was no big deal, it also like ate, it, ate like ate at me for three days why aren't they responding yeah. um so it's just I, I think patience would probably be or more patience excellent question number two yes would would you rather know a little about a lot of things or a lot about one thing um you know what i used to say that i know um just enough about almost every topic that I can have, like, that I, I can have like one interesting fact. And then if they like, there was a follow up question, I would just slowly back out of the room. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's been very valuable from a networking standpoint, to be able to like, kind of walk into anything. And also like, what do you want to know everything about something like, I'd, right? I'd, I'd rather know like a bunch of weird little things um, about a lot of different things. Because I think like, you know, just curiosity is way more interesting than, than being a know-it-all. <laughs> Question number three, what do you need from the grocery store? Uh, a lot, actually. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I like today was supposed to be grocery day, but, um, things. So I would say, um, it's easier to say it's easier to tell you what I have in my fridge than tell you what I need. Wow. We're, we're down to hummus, peanut butter and jam, tuna, uh, some, some turkey slices, um, about half of bread, and uh, have um, Dr. Pepper Zero Sugar. If you guys haven't tried Dr. Pepper Zero Sugar, um, I'm sure it's not good for you, but it tastes <laughs> just like Dr. Pepper. And I can somehow like justify drinking it now because it's, it's zero sugar. But nice. I'm sure I'm just drinking like pure saccharin or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question number four. Yes. Would you, would you like to survive the zombie apocalypse? Not really. No, mm -hmm. like, um, I, um, I don't want to die or anything like that. I, I'm not like one of these people thing, but, um, but I'm like, I, I won't go camping. Like I'm, I'm <laughs> like, I'm roughing. It is like, here's a great example. Um, there, I know people who will go to like far away places and stay in like really not very nice accommodations. And mm -hmm. I'm just like, I'd rather just not take the trip. Like I'll just wait till I can afford, like at least, you know, stay at like, like a holiday inn or express or, yeah. or something like I, I'm, I'm, I'm not made for dirt floors and tents and things like that. I'm, I'm, I'm city folk. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to roll this die. All right. See what comes up. Number 14. Okay. Pete Rose. Where, where are we right. going with that? <laughs> Let's see. Number 14. Oh my gosh. This is, you're the perfect person for this question. Saul, what's your story? 
What's my story? That's like a whole other um, episode. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, to, to quote Steve Martin, I was just a, I was, I was, I was a poor black child who, who was, uh, you know, set out in the world to, to find myself. Um, I, I think my story is literally like another two hours. So, um, and I don't know if my story is completely finished being written. Um, there's still a bunch of things I'm trying to accomplish. There's still uh, a bunch of things I want to do. And, and you know, like uh, I've got tons of personal goals, professional goals. Um, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I, you know, we talked earlier about not looking back and only looking forward. That's what I'm like really trying to do. So I, I'm, you know, I, I, I think my story and all my experiences have made me who I am. But, um, but man, like I, even just through the pandemic, I'm not even the same person I was, you know, at the beginning. And I think I appreciate people more. And I've like, I finally get why people take so many pictures with their friends because I didn't before and stuff like that. And except and that so, one of the three of us in New York, yes, of course. <laughs> yes. Um, but um, yeah, I think my story is still being written. I hope I've got, you know, many more years to, to still you know, be relevant, which is like, it's really tough. You know, if people ask you what's the hardest thing in, in your career, it's like staying relevant is really hard. Um, you know, and I'm pretty fortunate. I, I've, you know, sort of, I've had my ups and I've had my downs and I've ridden the roller coaster, but I've always sort of been able to figure my way back to the middle without reinventing myself. Cause I, I don't think if I were to reinvent myself, I'd be being truly true to myself. So I've been able yeah. to sort of keep who I am with that. Like I look at some of these people and like any new thing that comes out, all of a sudden they're the clubhouse expert or they're the chat GPT <laughs> expert. And it's the same guy. And then yeah. I'm just like, man, that must be exhausting. Yeah. Um, I just, I just want to be myself. And, you know, it's like, if, if you like what I can provide or, or, or the, you know, the, 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 the focus on the world, then like, like, let's be friends. If you don't like it, it's okay. Like, I, I truly believe like, you know, you don't need a hundred friends. You need like 10 people that really fucking love you and you can sort of live the rest of your life with that and, and stuff like that. And that was another lesson that took me forever to learn. Um, you know, it's like when you find the people that are good to you, hold them close and, you know, don't, don't throw people to the side because there's someone shinier or, or, or whatever. Cause it's, it's just, it's not worth it. Well, Saul, we really fucking love you. No, I love you guys too. You guys are, are, are literally like, in my my top two favorite people and you can figure out <laughs> who's one or two want to duke it out Riz? <laughs> no no i'm willing to concede speaking <laughs> speaking of stand-up comedians um sarah silverman has a new mm -hmm. hbo special it is so good it's on and my watch so, list yeah it is so good and there's this funny joke in it she's checking to a hotel and this woman goes you are one of my top four favorite comedians and sarah goes well you know that means i'm fourth or she wouldn't have said top four <laughs> <laughs> and i just thought that's a really great joke that is a really mm -hmm. great joke i like it yeah. all right well rick wrap us up send us home uh well, he hates this part. as we as we started the the beginning of the season and the beginning of this episode, Saul was on our dream list of guests from the very first day we started concepting this whole thing, and and we had to basically hold back on inviting him until we had our shit worked out and thought it would be a compelling opportunity for him. Uh, not that he wouldn't have mucked through. I would through. have done episode one. Yeah, yeah. he would have mucked through the shittiness with us, but we, we wanted to make it special for you because I love you dearly. Cammie loves you dearly. Uh, I love the way our lives have randomly intertwined. I, I think the the only way I can kind of like shove it into an analogy or encapsulate it is Saul is a version of me 
that you picked the other opportunity in the choose your own adventure and you kept taking the risks with every chance you got and being able to stay in touch with him and engage with Saul through the things that he does is always just such a rewarding experience and, and entertaining experience. <laughs> I'm like, I, I would have never fucking done that. That guy's crazy. So, uh, Saul, so just love you so much. Thank you for taking the time. Not only are you a correspondent, but we will continue this mini series at a at a later date and and have you back. It's it's just the time flies by so fast with you. And and thank you for for spending it with us. I am available for the two of you, online, offline, anytime you need. <laughs> it is always my pleasure and my honor. And um, whatever you need. Uh, forever. You just ask. Mm-hmm.